Like if Israel goes through with their threat tonight or in the next 24 hours, that they're going to hit back at Iran, which we're told Joe Biden and the United States government has intervened to tell Israel, don't take a win. No one was killed in these Iranian strikes on Israel. There was some military damage and maybe their pride was hurt in Israel, but nobody was killed. Unlike the Israeli attack, which did kill many people and the many other attacks previously that killed many people and the genocide, et cetera. There's a lot of dead bodies behind Israel. Iran, on the other hand, hasn't killed anybody. So suffice to say, the United States says, take a win, Tel Aviv. Your air defense was victorious. Your Iron Dome was glorious. Your David Sling, your Aero 3, all of your various uh, defense systems, along with the THAAD uh, radar and missile systems that the United States has. Uh, it was a great victory. Just cash in your chips and you can fight another day, but not now. That's what Washington was telling the Israelis. Um, so if Israel does hit back at Iran, then we got a slight problem uh, because Iran says they're going to hit back 10, 10 times as hard. 10 times as hard. So that means they're going to fire probably more advanced missiles at more specific military targets. And who knows, maybe even hypersonic missiles. So that's what Israel and the United States and their allies have to contend with if the ladder of escalation continues. Um, if it stops here, there might be a chance for more constructive negotiated settlements, especially regarding this uh, horrific situation in Gaza. Okay. So, but uh, that may not happen. We might not get a chance for that to happen. We'll see what happens over the next 24 hours. Now, let's just get a retrospective and a review, a summary of events. And I want to get the reactions uh, from a fantastic uh, journalist based in Britain. He's also a great geopolitical analyst. He is a historian. He is an author. His name is Tony Gosling. He's joining us right now on the live link. Tony, how are you? Hi, Patrick. Thank you very much for inviting me on. And, and, and you know, you're, you're puffing me up to be something I'm, you know, I aspire to. I'm not sure if I'm able to reach all those. But you're right. I mean, I have written, uh, I've written two books which I published during the lockdown. One is an anthology of secret governments since the English Civil War, right up to the assassination of Princess Diana and beyond, which is not my writing. It's an anthology of stuff I've picked up over the, I was going to say the centuries, no, the decades. Um, and that's called The Siege of Heaven Reader. And then I've also done this book, which is the kind of UK version of Operation Paperclip, which is linking the Nazis to Winston Churchill and the British government in World War II and showing the deals that were done at the end of the Second World War with the Brits rather than, as most people know about Paperclip, uh, but very few people realise that, you know, the, the, the very, very tight, close links there were between, in 1944 and 45, the end of World War II, between Churchill's private secretary and Hitler's private secretary, the deals being done for all that looted wealth of Europe. Well, it's kind of relevant to what we're looking at right now in the Middle East, Tony, as you know, the formation of the state of Israel, the creation of the Zionist state, the role that was played by even Nazi Germany, um, as well as the British in the formation of Israel. All these things have led us to the present day. And this is definitely in your wheelhouse because I know you follow Israeli, Middle East and Iranian politics very closely, as well as British and American foreign policy, Tony. So let me just backtrack a little bit. Let's go back about 72 hours, Tony. What were you thinking on Friday? Did you think that Iran, because it was the most extraordinary thing, Tony. They're saying Iran has announced they're going to strike. All the U.S. intelligence people were screaming, waving their hands, going hysterical. When that happens, Tony, all these alarm bells normally go off in the back of my mind saying something strange is going on. Are we going to get a false flag here? What's happening? What were you thinking at that point? Well, my immediate thoughts, so it sounds, sounds like similar to yours, actually, Patrick, which is why is this all being flagged up? so long beforehand quite clearly the iranians have decided that they're doing this in a very sort of open transparent even though they're using diplomatic back channels uh, and flying these drones slowly sort of coming in announcing it all hours before the drones even reached israel uh, this is quite clearly part of the tactic uh, to uh, i suppose pre-prepare the world for something uh, this we wouldn't normally expect that with a military strike by one country on another. Certainly, the Israelis never flag anything up 
that they're doing beforehand. And so this was really extraordinary. And the fact that uh, whatever strike it was, was uh, moving in at, you know, subsonic speed, chugging along these old drones. Uh, yeah, very peculiar. Um, uh, but actually, you can see why they've done it. And that is uh, that they're trying to give the impression anyway of doing this in a sort of open manner. We're not trying to hide anything. The drones are coming and we're 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 hitting back in as open a way as they can. I think they've they've decided that once they've decided to retaliate in some way, I think this is quite a mature way to do it. In fact, uh, in the public eye rather than out of the public eye, everything the Israelis do seems to be in an underhand fashion, secret. They they use the um, uh, deny they they deny, for example, they've still not admitted to my knowledge. Uh, that they they were behind the uh, attack on the consulate in Damascus, the Ir Iranian consulate, uh, because they they uh, neither confirm nor deny because they know that this is going to be an awkward thing for them to justify on the world media stage. The Iranians have taken completely the opposite point of view is they're trying to be open with the world about what they're doing. I think it's that simple. And uh, in, in international relations language, Tony, they call that the behave, the predictable behavior of a normative power, a normative world power. And UN Security Council members are expected to behave like this. They're saying to their adversaries, you violated uh, international law, you've crossed this red line. Now we're going to do this and it's going to be deliberate. It's going to be reciprocal. So this is a normative power. And Tony, throughout history, uh, the international system tends to favor normative state actors. Israel, on the other hand, is not a normative state actor. They act uh, almost with impunity as a rogue state, if you will, completely outside the bounds of pretty much every international norm you can possibly think of, especially at the last six months and look what look what's happened. So in this way, Tony, do you think this is a big moment for the Islamic Republic of Iran where they're now stepping onto a sort of different platform now internationally? Well, I think the Iranian Republic has for many years has wanted to strike back at Israel, uh, but they've just they just waited for the right opportunity and by the Israelis uh, opening up this new front by uh, by destroying the consulate in Damascus, their consulate, uh, this has really given them uh, a causeless belly to do that. Um, you know, you know, this this they're, 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 let's just be clear about the, the history here, because the United States uh, and the French and uh, the Israelis have been involved in terrorist attacks on his on Iranian soil for many years now. I mean, some of the it really has increased since 2010. We've had assassinations of the um, these nuclear various nuclear scientists, politicians and generals recently, obviously, with Soleimani and these two generals in Damascus. So this has been going on and on and on. And I think what the Iranians are saying is that, that, that we need to send a very clear signal to the world and to particularly to the Israelis that this just is not allowed to carry on. It is, it's a very peculiar and strange way to proceed uh, if you're at war with a country to just do assassinations. I mean, what are they doing? They're assassinating people who, the Israel, Israelis have been assassinating people who are, uh, the, I mean, there was a bomb attack on the entire Israeli, uh, sorry, I I Iranian cabinet. Uh, there's been two of those it, through through history by the the NATO powers, by the Western powers and the Israelis, all involved in these things by you know joint in work of intelligence services to carry out these attacks, uh, and also of course on um, the, the Israelis have been attacking uh, not necessarily Iranian but certainly uh, clerics. I remember always remember the the killing of Sheikh Yassin many years ago. This guy was a uh, you know preaching for peace. Uh, he was very much, though, uh, stalwart in saying that you have the right to self-defense. That's all he was saying. And, there, and because he was a, a powerful Islamic political leader uh, in the Palestinian territories, he was assassinated, too. So these assassinations, they are they are doable, you know, in the world of hybrid warfare. But the thing is that they cannot carry on. They cannot continue. And it, they are they are. Should we say easy? I mean, they are much easier to do than uh, to take on an entire nation. And what, of course, the idea is with these assassinations is to try to destabilize the leadership to uh, uh, its personal attacks on the leadership. And that works if you've got a fragile leadership, like somewhere like Saudi Arabia, a few people running the country with very little 
democratic accountability. But it doesn't work, I don't think, in a place like Iran, which has and, and Russia as well, which has a much more spread leadership. So when these people are assassinated, there are others who will take their place. It doesn't really affect things that much, in my view. Uh, and we've also got to understand the history of uh, the Israeli statements about their intentions towards the rest of the world and towards Iran. Uh, there was the famous statement by Moshe Dayan, who was the general in charge during the uh, 1967 um, Six Day War, and in the 1970s the Yom Kippur War. The, you know, the the leader of the IDF in those days, uh, he said, "Israel must be like a mad dog, too dangerous to bother," and that seems to have been enshrined in in Israeli foreign policy. So. Just don't even think about taking us on because something terrible is going to happen to you. The Israelis, by the way, the Zionists, in fact, in the 1940s, invented the letter bomb. They invented the car bomb. They uh, they were making plans to assassinate Winston Churchill, MI5 files revealed a few years ago. They were making plans to assassinate Truman, President Truman in the United States, uh, and also Ernest Bevin, who was the British Foreign Secretary uh, after the second, just after the Second World War in 1946, they were tr planning. Uh, an old colleague at the BBC of mine actually did a, um, a, a document program, a whole 30-minute documentary about the attempt, uh, the attempt to kill Ernest Bevin. And so these are the tactics that I'm afraid cowards use. They're not prepared to take on the system, but they think that they can make some sort of uh, victory by taking out a few influential individuals. Uh, this, I'm afraid, does not endear them to the rest of the world. Even if they had a you know, sort of a just cause of some sort, uh, these are underhand tactics, the sort of things that um, we saw uh, going on in the Second World War quite a lot. But there's another quote. Uh, this is by Martin Van Creveld. Uh, I don't know if you've come across him. He's an Israeli historian uh, at uh, Hebrew University. He said, we have the capability in 2002, he says, we had the capability to take the world down with us. Now, this is the most irresponsible sort of comment you could imagine from a kind of nuclear armed doomsday cult. Uh, so that sort of thing. And he, he also said, it, I think I'm not sure which date he said it, but then he was also, I mean, admitting to the, uh, the, the, the possession of nuclear weapons by the Israelis. He also talked about uh, the, 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 the weapons that we've got, the nuclear weapons can be pointed in any direction. They could even hit Rome, he said. So this is a, a direct threat also to the European capitals, to the European powers. And that's what I mean about the, uh, you know, the mad dog too dangerous to bother. Uh, even your allies uh, are being threatened with nuclear strikes by the Israelis. Uh, and I think the whole world is getting tired of this. There's only a handful of people, I think, that really support them. They are, um, you know, the likes of uh, David Cameron, who was installed by Charles III as, as Foreign Secretary uh, on uh, Remembrance Sunday last year, like a, a month after the October the 7th attacks. Uh, the Foreign Secretary and the Foreign Office weren't obviously weren't playing ball. And so this guy had to be brought out of his retirement. Uh, the man behind the war in Libya, the attacks on Libya. Uh, you've also got Rishi Sunak from Goldman Sachs, who basically will read out anything that he's put in front of him. Uh, it, there, uh, and of course, you've got Joe Biden, who sort of wanders around the stage looking for the microphone. And you're lucky if you could get a, a two sentences uh, of sense out of the guy. Uh, and, and so these are the few people, plus obviously the deep state, the intelligence services, uh, the, the financial institutions, many of them are supportive of the Zionists too. Uh, but most of the people I think around are aware of just how dangerous the um, the uh, attack on uh, on Gaza and the genocide that's been taking place, 35,000 or so innocent people uh, um, genocided by the Israelis has been. Uh, and so, you know, I've also, I mean, two minds about uh, Friday night and Saturday morning, because I can see that the support for the Israelis has been crumbling in the West, Patrick. Uh, we've seen all sorts of diplomatic uh, and, and um, political pressure being put onto the British government and the US government to rein back the uh, Israelis. And although it's, it's galling to see them get away with these crimes, particularly for the Arab countries uh, and the Iranians surrounding Israel, uh, you can see that the Israelis have make, been, been making so many terrible mistakes by this uh, committing this genocide, telling so many lies. 
uh, I, I'm, you know, sitting back and watching this. I'm tempted to just let them get on with making these mistakes, with telling these lies and see their credibility crumble. Of course, they've got problems in Tel Aviv and in Jerusalem too. these mass demonstrations by Israeli citizens also uh, uh, calling for the uh, the end of the Netanyahu regime. And uh, and so uh, in a way, the attack by Iran has, has maybe given them a little bit of a new lease of life and they might feel that they can uh, now uh, hold their heads up high and say, oh dear, we've been attacked. Uh, but uh, I, th I think ultimately, when I saw this on uh, Friday, I mean, I, you know what? I remember the first Gulf War. This is 1989, 1990. I had a similar sort of feeling. My God, are we going to wake up tomorrow in World War Three? Uh, you know, this is when the Scud missiles were attacking from Iran into Israel, and we weren't sure if there was going to be some sort of nuclear response by the Israelis. Uh, you know, that, I was feeling a similar in a similar way when the brinksmanship of the United States and Britain, the so-called coalition of the willing under Bush senior, started attacking uh, I I I Iraq. And the Iraq, because the Iraqis, of course, then started sending their missiles over to Israel, knowing that this was really uh, a proxy war that the Americans were doing for the Israelis back then. So every time there's some sort of escalation over there. I think we need do need to sort of sit and uh, scratch our heads and hold our breath a little bit because we know they've got hundreds of nuclear weapons, the Israelis, and they are very unpredictable there, as we've seen in Gaza, an extremely dangerous lot. Uh, they are racists, uh, they are maniacs, and they've got someone at the helm, Netanyahu, who is trying to keep this war going uh, in order to try to dodge jail. He should be in jail. He's been prosecuted for fraud. Uh, and so he knows he's got to keep the war going to stay out of prison, Patrick. Yeah, maybe even stay out of The Hague for that matter. But just backtracking a little bit, you're talking about all these assassinations that Israel's been doing, and they were kind of gnawing away at the edges of Iran's uh, assets, their people, their positions in uh, neighboring countries like Syria, for instance. And Iran's position has always been that of strategic patience. But that's all changed now. Now the bar has been reset in a way. Now it's stri uh, active strategic measures, active deterrence. That's the new Iranian policy. They've, they've announced that if Israel retaliates in Iran or hits any of their assets, and correct me if I'm wrong, Tony, they're saying any assets and any Iranian assets anywhere in the world that they're going to hit back 10 times harder than they did over the weekend. That's a very different reality, isn't it, than the last 50 years. So in a way, things have reset. But when you listen to the Israelis and some people in America and Rishi Sunak and some of these hawks, David Cameron, for instance, Lord Cameron, pardon me, um, it, 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 they, they're still living in the past. Tony, I don't think, do you think that they understand the new reality that this is not the same Middle East that it was 20 years ago, 10 years ago? Yes, I think they, ha they have to understand that. Look, I mean, the Israelis have the same policy. We will hit back 10 times harder. Look at the kill ratio be between the IDF uh, and uh, the Gazan people. You know, we're talking about something like a 100 to 1 kill ratio there. Uh, so... The Israelis have the same, um, you know, we will escalate this quickly policy and we will, uh, and this is the same sort of thing, actually, you know, the punishment killings by the Nazis in the Second World War, when they would surround towns and kill tens or even hundreds of citizens of a town, which they said had been harboring a few partisans or maybe given some partisans some food. This was the same sort of uh, uh, punishment killings, the uh, non-proportionate stuff. This, this is what the UN really should be dealing with Patrick I think you know but yes I think the uh, the world is slowly waking up to this idea that this is a real powder keg look I mean you, you, just to take a step back from the history of all this because we have to understand how Israel got there in the first place it's this kind of crusader state uh, mm -hmm. the first world war was when uh, General Allenby the British General Allenby uh, swept the uh, Turks aside with the hundreds of thousands of uh, soldiers on both sides died in the uh, campaigns in the first world war to uh, move the the turks the the ottoman empire out of palestine and up to the north and then once that had happened immediately the armistice was signed once the you know the the battle i think it was the battle of megiddo uh the final battle in the first world war in the middle east to get rid of the turks uh, the armistice of world war one was signed and i remember looking at the timing thinking well maybe that was what world war one was really all about and then of course you have a second world war in europe but uh, the israeli state created in 1948 which was 
uh, very much Victor Rothschild in London's uh, creation. He managed to get the Soviets uh, on side, which was an incredible thing to do, uh, to vote for the creation of the State of Israel. In, in the Roland Perry, the Australian writer's uh, book, uh, The Fifth Man, he explains all the background to what Victor Rothschild had been up to in the Second World, World War and also to do with the creation of the State of Israel. He said he was the number one guy. Obviously, the Balfour Declaration was part of the Rothschild family too. But over in the States, it was Nelson Rockefeller that got the South American votes for Rothschild. So it's the Rockefellers and the Rothschilds helping to get that vote through in 1948. A very important um, thing was said to the first prime minister, Ben Gurion, uh, and that was you can have a, a, a vengeance or a state, but not both. This is John Loftus told me this, the special investigator of the FBI under Jimmy Carter of a lot of these Nazi war criminals. And he said that, that the significance of that was that uh, you could either come after the Nazi war criminals if you wanted, uh, he said to the Zionists at the uh, creation of the Israeli state, or you can leave them alone and we will deliver the votes for you to have a state. Uh, and so that's how it was created. And I think we have to just understand this is a, a pernicious thing right from the start. Uh, there are many, many Jews around the world, certainly friends of mine, that want nothing whatsoever to do with this state the Zionists have created. They're trying desperately to make out that this is you know, all of Jewry that supports them. Of course, they don't. And this is really just spin. But even more, even more important is this uh, I think the uh, it's disputed, but I think if you're looking at what's been actually happening over the last uh, 100 years or so there, uh, it's this letter of Albert Pike, uh, which was written in uh, the 1880s, uh, which spells this spells out the whole plan for the creation of a fake religious war in the Middle East between the Zionists and the Islamic world. So, you know, the Islamic world is genuinely trying to defend itself against massive provocations. Uh, from this heretical, uh, uh, Judaistic, uh, uh, actually a secular state, uh, which is working uh, to these with these um, Masonic plans in mind, the uh, the the uh, Scottish Rite Freemason Albert Pike's plan to create this massive conflagration in the Middle East. And I think, actually, you know, I first heard about this from uh, some friend of mine who spoke Arabic, who'd been spending six months living with the Bedouin. Uh, and this is one of the things that they talk about. Yeah, this Albert Pike guy, they've been cooking up a third world war for us in the Middle East for many years. We're aware of this. Uh, and so that's why I think the the behavior and the military tactics and the disposition uh, of the Islamic world and of the Arab world, particularly. I mean, let's forget for a moment about, the, you know, some of the anti-Israeli Jews and Christians that are living in the area and also atheists and people of other faiths in the Middle East, you know, they don't seem to get talked about too much, but of course they're caught up in the middle of this, uh, is, is this in almighty struggle that they're trying, this war, they're trying to get it going. The purpose is literally, the, is Naomi Klein's shock doctrine, the bigger the war, the more money you can make out of it and the more geopolitical influence you can then bring out of that chaos. Uh, and you know the Scottish rights, I'm sure you do know, the Scottish right Freemasonry's uh, motto is Ordo Ab Chao, Order from Chaos. They're at chaos merchants. If they can create, the bigger the war they can create, the more chaos they, get, they can create, the more they like it, because the more they think that they can control the outcome and use it to their own geopolitical ends. So there's much more to this than I think than uh, we're seeing in the, certainly the news coverage uh, in this part of the world, which is looking at these individual attacks, uh, ignoring a lot of the history of the tensions between Iran and Israel, certainly ignoring many of the crimes, the war crimes of the Israeli state over the last 20, 30 years, and particularly the last decade or so, uh, and the statements that the uh, Netanyahu and others have made. And of course, one thing that hardly gets mentioned at all is this hundreds of nuclear weapons that the, it, the Israelis possess. They accuse the Iranians of possessing nuclear weapons. They're saying, oh, you're developing these things. We've got, to, we've got to get rid of Iran before they develop. Well, they've actually got an Islamic fatwa out, as I'm sure you know, against nuclear weapons. They believe that they're totally unethical, they're so indiscriminate. And so they've said that they will not build them. Uh, now, mm. whether there are nuclear weapons were available on the black market in the 1990s is another question, uh, you know, from the former Soviet Union as the 
uh, the the soldiers and the you know hadn't been paid for months and years some of them they were it's alleged by by the reporter roger cook uh, in his in his uh, documentary dirty bomb he was uh, offered a ss20 uh, which is a three i believe it's got three warheads on it nuclear uh, uh missile system uh for a price of millions of dollars to certain millions of dollars to the uh the russian army at the time so it is possible that these nuclear weapons have been circulating around on the black market but uh the the iranians have publicly said to their own people and to the world we do not want nuclear weapons we've got no interest because they're far too indiscriminate we don't agree and believe in them uh, and so we don't want them thank you very much yet they're always getting accused of trying to develop nuclear weapons by the israelis who themselves never talk about the ones uh, except when they do and do you remember uh within the, the gaza thing first started back in i think it was november last year uh we had one of the uh the ministers uh of the uh, uh of the israel of the israelis talking about nuking oh we could nuke gaza uh well hang on that must mean you've got nuclear weapons if you can nuke gaza so they they do admit it but they don't like to the americans don't like to hear it they put their fingers in their ears because they know that uh, th this would be violations of all their uh, nuclear treaties then they would then the americans would then have to cut off the financial support for israel uh, uh, none of it, none of that applies system. None of that applies to Israel as far as Washington is concerned. Anyway, they get a free pass even on the nuclear card, believe it or not, at the moment. Uh, Tony Gosling, we're uh, talking about Iran, Israel, what's happening next. We're going to take a quick break here with the network TNT. When we come back, we're going to talk about the nuclear deterrent, the nuclear threshold, and also the reactions of Joe Biden and the British government to these latest round of hostilities. All this and more coming up. Stay right there. I was such a young age. Everything changed. My name is Chloe. When I was 13, my dad was diagnosed with cancer. When I found out, I just didn't know how to react. I felt like everything was just kind of closing in on me. It just became a routine. Dad's doing chemo. I'd come home from school, wait for mum to finish work, and we'd go straight to the hospital, spend a few hours there, just draw. It was hard to navigate going to school, hundreds of kids, and I was the only one with a dying dad. He was diagnosed in March, and then he died in October. Towards the end, I heard about Canteen. It kind of felt nice to know that they had other people like me. They understood what I was going through, and we didn't even have to chat about cancer. In 2020, I became a youth ambassador, so I can help others the way they helped me. I've done so many things since I was 13. I've graduated high school, university, gotten my licence, made a move across the country. Life now is just a whole lot more fun. Please give a gift today to support more young people like me experiencing cancer. Whatever happened to good, it's a word that gets thrown around a lot and it's become our automatic answer to so much. Hey, how's things? Good. Your mum, your weekend? Good, good. Is good even that good anymore? At the Selbos, we believe good deserves better. Let's reclaim its true meaning. To us, good has always been about making a difference, and good never picks or chooses who it helps. Isn't it time we all remember what good really means? You're with Patrick Henningsen on today's News Talk Radio, TNT. All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the program. We're still in the first hour of this live broadcast. I'm Patrick Henningsen, your host. Thank you for rejoining us. Hello to everybody in the TNT chat community. Great to see you guys in there. We see some of the usual suspects coming in there. Great numbers as well. Uh, we had at the end of last week getting up over 100 almost uh, during that program. So, yeah, I was seeing some migration into our amazing chat community there at TNT during this amazing program and our amazing guest, of course, on the line. Tony Gosling and Tony I'm uh I'm kind of curious about the reaction firstly of the United States the uh, Joe Biden actually calling to restrain the mad dog uh as you as you well put it uh, Netanyahu in this uh, incredible right-wing regime uh in Tel Aviv then we've got the British uh they're trying to act uh like their shoulder to shoulder with america and israel uh but kind of inconsistent on their policies i've got a clip here from lord cameron uh this strange foreign secretary that doesn't sit in the house of commons and he was put on the spot about this very issue on the consistency of 
the policy of the British position, and he didn't really have a very good answer for it. Let's go ahead and roll this clip. I want to get your reaction after this, Tony. Yeah, but um, what about Iran's frustration at part of its sovereign territory being flattened? Well, I would argue there is a, a massive degree of difference between what Israel did in Damascus and, as I said, 301 weapons being launched by the state of Iran at the state of Israel. For the first time, a state-on-state -state attack. 101 ballistic missiles, 36 cruise missiles, 185 drones. That is a degree of difference. Yeah. And I think a reckless and dangerous thing for Iran to have done. And I think the whole world can see all these countries that have somehow wondered, well, you know, what is the true nature of Iran? It's there okay. in black and white. What would Britain do if a hostile nation flattened one of our consulates? Well, we would take, you know, we would take the very strong action. And Iran would say that that's what they did? Well, what they did, as I said, was a so massive they, attack. So they were right think, to respond, but they overreacted, is well, that what you're I, saying? I, what I'm saying they is that the, right atta the, attack, the attack they carried out was on a very large scale, much bigger than but people they accepted. they have a right to respond? Well, countries have a right to respond when they feel they've suffered uh, an aggression. Of course they do. But look at the scale of that response. Had those weapons not so been shot right down, respond, but they there, just could been, there could have been thousands of casualties, including civilian casualties. I think that's a really important point to take into account. Is, is this credible? I mean, is his answer credible, Tony? What do you think? Well, look, Lord Cameron of Benghazi, the butcher of Libya, uh, the man that's turned that country into such a basket, one of the people anyway, has turned it into such a basket case where you've now got live slave trading on the streets. It used to be uh, the country which had the highest standard of living anywhere in Africa. Uh, uh, you know, so this is the man who is the chaos merchant, the destroyer of worlds. Uh, pontificating obviously he's totally biased he just wants to support the Israelis and that's why he's been put in that job it would have been very diff difficult I think for James Cleverly the former foreign secretary to uh, posture in that fashion but Cameron's got form which is why Charles III has employed him to do that job and I don't think uh, Sunak take plays any role whatsoever this is Charlie uh, doing all this and the British position is so ridiculous that you know I don't know if you noticed over the weekend uh, that the Spanish government sent a very clear message to the British government saying we're not having your aerobatic RAF display team down here in Gibraltar, thank you very much. You're not overflying any of the Spanish airspace with them. We don't trust you. We don't like you. We think you're involved in this genocide that's going on in Goa. This is me paraphrasing. Uh, these are very clear diplomatic messages that the Spanish have sent to London, that Madrid has sent to London over the British support for the genocide. And, and this is uh, people like Cameron, uh, who are making making these uh, idiotic statements uh, about, oh, I don't think we, 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 we would really respond if, you know, if the uh, a British consulate, say, uh, in, in, in Iran or Damascus was attacked, say, by the Israelis and several British generals were killed and another five staff making seven altogether, which is what happened in uh, in Damascus, of course, there would be a massive response by the Brits, but he just can't admit to that. Uh, because he's a kind of gang merchant person. He's the sort of person that works with his little clique of mates uh, to do what they're trying to do, which is to start a third world war, no less. That's what I think that they're actually up to. Uh, as I said before, you know, they think they can make a lot of capital out of this. They can make some big geopolitical changes. But also the Spanish also said to the Brits that they're not allowed to bring their uh, HMS Queen Elizabeth aircraft carrier in either. So there are uh, European countries and countries all around the world are now seeing not only Israel as a, a disgusting pariah state, but the Brits too. And I'm glad uh, that the, the uh, foolishness and the recklessness uh, is um, is having its effect. But look, there's also the other thing, which is at the and you, one of the things you messaged me about, which was what should happen at the UN Security Council. Well, mm -hmm. uh, Craig Murray's made it very clear, and I totally agree with him that we need to see some action actually fingers out folks um, from the Chinese and the Russians at the UN Security Council. Uh, and of course the Americans will veto this for a while, uh, but who knows, uh, a UN uh, uh, military force in Gaza to protect mm -hmm. the Palestinians, I think is what's absolutely necessary. And they're gonna have to start confronting uh, this genocide and, and doing something about it. Obviously, that first thing that that force would do would be to allow the aid in and, and to stop the Israelis massacring and murdering people who are collecting aid, but then also uh, uh, potentially to put, to put a no-fly zone 
over that part of the territory because otherwise international law is breaking down it's going to break down uh, so i think that's a really important sort of uh, positive move that there could be to have an armed peacekeeping peacekeeping force led by the the chinese at the un and the russians at the un uh, to uh, make sure that this genocide is brought to an end patrick i don't know if you you know you, what you think but the, the un security council is got to be uh, doing something positive and useful here. It's got to show that it's got a bit of teeth. Uh, I, I, I was watching the uh, Cold Case Hammerschold documentary uh, a few days ago on BBC4 here in the UK, uh, which talks about the assassination by, uh, it looks like the CIA and MI6 and the Belgian mining companies uh, of the uh, the UN Secretary General back in 1961, who was trying to, you know, to, to help African countries uh, uh, after they'd uh, got their independence to resist the neo-colonial activities of the British intelligence, uh, still trying to claim all the territories over there and the particularly mining rights. Uh, and so the UN needs to really, uh, I think, assert itself and make sure that there's some sort of peacekeeping force sent into Gaza uh, before any more uh, thousands of uh, innocent people die there to help get the aid through, if, if not, if nothing else, to get the aid through the borders. Yeah, yeah, through 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 the Rafa border crossing, not building a jetty, not the U.S. military building a, no. a, a, a big theatrical a floating pier uh, to bring in the aid by ship and then do all the public relations and all the uh, uh, glor glorious uh, CNN uh, sound bites and videos about how wonderful and humanitarian the U.S. military is saving the poor people of Gaza. So I think you're right, Tony. Uh, first order of business from the U.N. Security Council has to be a de-escalation. And once that's a, that's established, then how do we get the aid through to pre-October 7th levels into Gaza ASAP immediately? without delay and i think uh you know and the this goes back to the u.s the the fact that the u.s is restraining israel um even if it's delaying israel it really shows you the nature of the of, of the reality of israel that it can't really do anything without its big brother with the big stick standing behind it it's the one supplying all of the military kit all the reconnaissance all the ammunition the bombs israel is nothing but a paper tiger without the united states giving it its full-throated backing and when the u.s believes that israel is a political liability or uh threatening their position internationally with their allies or other people other countries you know how quickly that phone call happens and israel can be brought to heel i think that's one of the important lessons that was shown here tony is that israel can be restrained if there's a political will to do it your final thoughts one minute left go ahead tony well uh, yeah i just like to to round up by saying that uh, I, I honestly believe that uh, it, almost by doing nothing is the best policy with the israelis because they have been hemorrhaging support uh, as i said with the uh, with the um, Spanish turning on the Brits saying, no, you're not using our airspace, you're not using our waters, thank you very much, go away, take the Royal Navy away, take the Royal Air Force away from here. Uh, the, all those that have been supporting the Israelis have been coming across these sorts of reactions. But ultimately, uh, we need to work for peace there. And the only way to do that is, I'm afraid, the United States has been invading countries left, right and centre, rather like the Nazis were in the late 1930s. Uh, and so somebody has got to draw a line somewhere. Uh, it's good to see the Iranians have done that, but without any loss of life, no loss of life on uh, Saturday morning. They, what they've done is they've just taken out their military capability, and that's a wonderful piece of military action. Tony Gosling, investigative journalist, historian, radio host, author. Thank you for joining us on TNT this week. There he goes, ladies and gentlemen. Excellent segment by Tony Gosling. We're going to take a break here. Top of the hour news headlines coming up. And on the other side, we're going to connect another author and pundit. Jay Dyer is going to join us in the second hour to talk about the end times, eschatology in Israel, Christian Zionism. Mm -hmm.